This next session is titled Redefining Your Brand. We'll be hearing about the trends and claims that are increasingly emerging in this space as companies respond to the increased consumer awareness and interest in making more sustainable choices. First up, we have Mike Pretty, Chair of New Zealand Food and Grocery Council. Mike's career spans over 30 years in the New Zealand and global food industry. He's held key roles at Watties New Zealand, including six years as Managing Director and six years as the Marketing Research and Development Director. Between those roles, for six years, he also held the global roles responsible for Heinz Ketchup, marketing capability and emerging market capability. For the last three years, Mike has been the Chair of New Zealand Food and Grocery Council. Please welcome Mike Pretty up on stage. Well, I feel a bit like an outsider, <clears throat> and I say that because Wait for it. I, I didn't actually grow up on a farm. Um, I didn't actually grow up in New Zealand, as you can probably tell pretty quickly. But, um, so I can't give you my anecdotes around um, um, farming and, and so on. But um, as you just heard, I, I have spent about three decades in, in the Watties company or companies, both locally and globally. Um, so I, I, I have some vague understanding of growing vegetables and fruit. Uh, which is very much the, you know, the backbone of the, of the Watties company. Um, I also apologise that I'm very much the disappointing speaker. It should have been Catherine Rich, who's the chief executive of the Food and Grocery Council, who's a wonderful fire brand of a person who would have done a far better job. So I'm going to try and share some borrowed knowledge today. And uh, as you'll see, a lot of my material is actually from IRI, which is the research company. And so I'm going to try and... Um, navigate my way through that. But first, seeing I have an audience of 300 people, um, I think it's really important I just talk a little bit about um, the, um, who the, <clears throat> the Food and Grocery Council is. As I said, my full-time job is actually at Watties. Um, when we had the votes to become chair, I was the person who, who walked backwards the uh, slowest, ended up being voted as chair. Um, so <laughs> And I'm sure there'll be a few people in the room who've um, experienced that, that same little um, challenge. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the New Zealand context when we're talking about the food and grocery sector. I appreciate fully that 95% uh, of the products that you collectively um, grow and, and produce and sell are, are going offshore. So I'll try and make my NZ narrative as relevant as possible, but we'll also try and sort of link that into some of the global bits and pieces. So as I said, um, given the fact that we have an audience, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Food and Grocery Council, and just in case anyone would like to sign up, I have some uh, subscription forms. Um, we're a kick-ass organization um, led by Catherine Rich, who you can see there who I'm cursing at the moment because she's on a long-term um, holiday, having accrued about two years' worth of leave over her 14 years as the chief executive of Food and Grocery Council. So a little bit like the Meat Industry Association, we're a representative organization. Probably one of the big differences is the, that um, <clears throat> the majority of our members are small to medium-sized companies, and, um, and we have an awful lot of small companies, which is very much the New Zealand landscape I, I also appreciate. We like to see ourselves as a respected voice. We work closely, um, as the Meat Industry Association does, with numerous organs of government. And I started this morning sitting with the MPI team, um, who we work closely with. I see Glenn Neal from Fazans. Uh, but we've also worked um, closely with immigration, health, and and, and lackly with um, competition and consumer affairs. Um, and I raise that simply because um, Catherine's profile has been probably lifted, um, maybe not always pleasantly, um, given the work that the Food and Grocery Council has been doing with the Commerce Commission to try and um, secure a mandatory code of conduct in the first step to increasing competition in the industry. And of course, lastly, like any industry sector, representative organizations been COVID, 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 and COVID. And uh, that's been the gift that has kept on, on giving. And Dan was just giving me some anecdotes from Silver Fern Farms as to how bad it's been. So let me start with talking about the, the sector. Um, it was actually at a, a very early COVID meeting, a cross-government um, meeting. Somebody said that, um, God, they had no idea 
what FMCG meant. But now they'd spent a few meetings with the sector, they realized that it really was a dynamic and fast-moving sector. And if you look here at the number of companies in the sector, you can see it's continuing to grow over the years. And that velocity continues to increase. And if I jump to the full builds here, um, and what you can see here is that medium-sized companies uh, are actually the growth engine of the, of the sector. And um, over the last two years, the, the medium-sized companies have grown 15%. And there are about 150 of them. The top 25 companies uh, rep, um, are actually pretty consistent between 2019 and 2021, um, except that Teagle has joined the, 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 um, the hallowed ranks. I think that probably says an awful lot about the growth of um, chicken demand, especially over the last um, few years. Only about half of the large companies are in growth. But I, I sort of raise this simply from a contextual perspective that 46% um, of this sector are small or medium-sized companies with sales of less than $10 million. So you're not talking to a sector with um, too many behemoths, unlike the meat industry where there are a lot of very big players um, obviously exporting. So, you know, the heart of that, um, it means that the, I suppose, the, the intellectual property that exists within these companies, you know, across all facets, whether it be regulatory or marketing or, or you know, scientific resources, often pretty scant. Um, and that makes it difficult for a lot of the sector to sort of keep up with the regulatory changes, a lot of the things I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to echo um, some of the comments that we've already heard from the panel with the, um, uh, the Todd Squared uh, talked a little bit about um, quite a few of these things. Um, and given the fact that we're an incredibly, um, uh, I suppose, connected um, globe these days, supply side disruption you know, has had its um, huge impact upon uh, whether you're a large or a medium, a medium or a small size company. Uh, you know, at the heart of matters, the cost of doing business has soared. Uh, we've heard about that. Um, strained supply chains and shipping issues. Um, you know, the company which pays me, you know, we've gone from, um, you know, uh, just in time manufacturing to, to just in case they just can't ship. And I, I suspect that we're, we know, we're not dissimilar. Um, we've suffered from a struggle with um, labor constraints. And then COVID in its incarnations over the last two years has been quite challenging. Um, and it's, we've seen incredible peaks in demand, um, which I won't go into, but you know, as an organization which, um, or, or as an industry, which prides itself in very careful sequential planning, when you have 100 or 200% demand in, in, um, overnight, it's very, very difficult to, to manage or the converse happens and your demand drops off. Um, I didn't think um, many of us would hear this in our lifetimes or current our careers right now around geopolitics, um, getting to where it has done. But also, um, you know, war and the concept of food security has become more and more important. And I think, you know, if we sort of keep that in the back of our minds when we go through this. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but, you know, frankly, no matter which metric you look at, consumers are being absolutely um, hammered. And, you know, I think you know, that's a sort of uh, not an intellectual or um, informed way of putting it, but it's, you know, times are tough, whether it be from fuel to food. You know, consumers are feeling it very much in the wallet. Um, and that's playing to them uh, emotionally as well. And when we look at just the sheer cost of going down to the, the supermarket, um, you know, consumers have seen uh, CPI rises like they've, they've not seen in many, many a year. And um, for those of you who, like me, sport gray hair, who've, who've lived through the GFC in 2008, 2009, or you know, some of the Asian crisis, we've seen a lot of the behaviors re-emerging that we're, we're now seeing. Um, you know, it's driven consumers back to very basic home meal preparation. You know, we see growth of products like, wait for it, frozen vegetables, cooking sauces, you know, the, the basics because they can, so as a, you know, as a primary food producer at home, um, you know, you can um, still feed the family for a reasonable price. Um, and then from a, from a supplier or brand manufacturer perspective, uh, you know, we've seen behaviors we've also seen before 
uh, around things such as downsizing or what is often called right-sizing, um, because it's more PC, or what the media like to call shrinkflation. Um, and then on the other, in, on the other hand, we've also seen the emergence of some larger packs, um, you know, bulk packs, value packs. So with inflation at a 32-year high, and so you've got to have had a pretty long career in the industry to have gone from, um, you know, the, the last big uh, inflationary spike all those years ago. Um, this is a race you don't want to win. And, um, you know, it's clear that we, whilst we sit behind the US and the UK, um, you know, we are in a worse situation than our primary frenemy, um, Australia, uh, are sitting at a, at a lower level of inflation. It's interesting that Boris Johnson, um, I probably shouldn't have used the word interesting, because Johnson is interesting at the best of times, but one of the things he did do before he got thrown out was to appoint David Buttress as the government's new cost of living business czar, um, which is a great title, and part of his mandate, and I'm sure some of you have read about this, um, is to um, you know, focus on food prices. And so apparently he's been collaborating closely with um, the retailers in the UK. I'm not sure we've quite gone that far here yet. Um, and, you know, and the retailers apparently are responding well to this. And, um, and I've seen some examples of companies like Morrison's, which is a big UK reta retailer, maybe not doing price lockdowns like we have here, but certainly offering kids um, free meals if a parent buys a, an adult meal in one of their, their restaurants or cafes. Um, quite what impact that's going to have upon uh, you know, the ongoing price of food um, is, is frankly a little bit hard to tell. The other trend which you will have seen and have, and have felt, uh, whether you sell domestically and uh, obviously I know you export, is just the fact that hospitality in New Zealand has also been absolutely pummeled. And you know, yes, we're on the resurgence um, and recovery, but you know, that also requires labor, which is another factor which um, is not really addressed. Um, and there's been some very interesting, I think, examples of just how this has played out. And you, know, you remember a couple of, probably a year ago now, the potato industry was tried to sort of fight um, anti-dumping on, uh, on French fries coming into the country. And that was entirely driven by the fact that fast food outlets across Europe and the US were shut. And so suddenly there was the potato mountain and, um, you know, and, and the, the, the suppliers were looking for a, a market to relocate their, their, their ample stock to. So some, you know, some of the impacts of COVID have been um, more interesting than others. Um, but you know, on the other side of the ledger, so hospitality was hammered. Um, on the other side of the ledger, uh, what we saw during the various lockdowns over the last couple of years is, uh, you know, the duopoly was monopolized. And, um, in a, a, and, you know, so as a consequence, the retailers have had, um, you know, unfettered access to consumers. And often for consumers across many markets, it's been a lifeline. The interesting sort of third aspect to that and um, I don't know your industry well enough to know exactly how this has played out for you, but it's just a phenomenal um, growth in online shopping. And whether you're shopping through um, somewhere like a countdown online here, or you sell into a European or UK retailers that have a big online presence. But um, some of these are you know, local facts. What we see is that e-retail is up 21% on 2020, which is a huge number. It's actually up 52% relative to pre-pandemic, pre um, and it's tipped to continue to grow. The number that IRI uh, believes is around 38% over the next two years. So online has become really very important as a, uh, as a trend, as a part of the marketing strategy for, for products and brands. And it's clear that it will continue to grow, and it represents about 13% um, of total sales. And I, um, I'm not sure whether any countdown people are here today, but you know, I think huge congratulations to them. They've been working in this space for over 10 years, and I think have done a 
phenomenal job, especially during COVID, and as I said, have been a lifeline. So in total, whilst the number of users apparently remained static, transactions were up 23%. Um, so the average consumer shopping online, um, they have about 33 different purchase occasions. So I don't know what the frequency of purchase of meat in the supermarket is, but um, you know, online is potentially not too far behind it if it is a weekly purchase. Um, online shoppers in New Zealand are spending now about three and a half thousand bucks um, a year. That's up from just under three thousand only a year ago, and that's up a thousand since 2019. So um, I suppose the moral is make sure that e-commerce is very much part of your brand strategy. Um, what I actually found both interesting and alarming is that the increased frequency and the increase in use in buy now, pay later is responsible for that growth. Um, and I think that last trend probably talks an awful lot about how hard consumers are finding it. One in 10 transactions are now um, buy now, pay later. Uh, and the prediction is it'll be up to 17% um, um, within a few years. <clears throat> so as I said, increased, um, sorry, I'm stuck on the same slide, increased retail spend in, in e-commerce has seen you know, Countdown's performance uh, step up exponentially, and, and you know, I think that's well deserved. As I said, if this is a trend that you're seeing through your consumer base um, over, overseas, it wouldn't surprise me, um, so I can't believe that New Zealand's an outlier. And because the motivations to go online for consumers must be very similar, you know, it's because it's been convenient, well, in COVID times, it's been safe as well, uh, but it's also simply about the ease of shopping. Um, and the speed of shopping. And the theory, um, I suppose, about 10 years ago when I was a little bit younger was that we'd see a tipping point into online when um, the current uh, generation who are in their early 20s bought their first, first homes and um, were digital natives, the first of the digital natives. And um, I think COVID has really ramped that, that, that up um, to, to an incredible degree. So, sort of finishing this section um, on a low, um, how, how do consumers feel? Well, I mean, you've seen this data, and it's not something that I'm sharing for the first time, but, you know, the hard, stark reality is that consumers are, have not been this low from a consumer confidence perspective for many, 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 many a year, and, um, and the sentiment from the study shows that consumers emotionally are in a worse place than they were um, after the GFC, which of course many of you in the room here looking around um, wouldn't actually have experienced um, first time around. So for those of you who are experiencing it for the first time, welcome. And um, <laughs> uh, it's no fun, um, but talk to someone older than yourself and they might be able to give you some insights. Now, lo looking around, there's plenty of them, um, which is great by the way. <laughs> Um, so now maybe switching gear a little bit about, um, I think hopefully that's all some useful backdrop to you. Um, when we look at what consumers are actually doing differently, now this is a, um, maybe it's a new reality, I don't know, but it's certainly a fact that about just under 30% of people now are working full time from home. And you know, that in itself must have driven um, a lot of the growth in, in uh, online shopping. But also, I think it, it plays to what consumers are purchasing. Interesting, the States, you know, a country well known for its fast food, um, data that I came across shows that 82% 82, 82 of meals were actually made in the home in January 2022, which was actually up from 77% only six months prior. So even in the States, uh, you know, we're seeing, it, we're seeing a shift. The other trend I, I thought was worth calling out is, is provenance, and it's something that I believe New Zealand does very well, and it's, I've worked globally and sort of seen this firsthand, but um, when you look at data like this, the, just over 50% of consumers claiming that they believe that provenance is really important, and you know, whilst this is not unique, the point that I sort of probably should have mentioned a little bit earlier was that apparently in online shopping, um, 
the, in, in, uh, sorry, the, the shopping behavior, that apparently 71% of all products purchased online were local, which um, I found you know, very positive, um, but it's also, I was quite surprised. So now changing gear a little bit to the US, and working from home is clearly redefining what brand companies like ourselves um, should be thinking about when it comes to designing products. And there are some sort of reasonably good sort of guides to what you need to be considering in a post-COVID or a, I suppose a transitionary to post-COVID world. And there are some very practical needs that need to be considered, such as easy prep foods, you know, a lot of people still um, desk dining or, um, I mean, keyboard dining, whatever the expression um, is, um, meal portion sizes, um, but also a key one that's emerging. We see this in, in the growth of, of, of cooking sources, especially, wait for it, premium cooking sources, is that consumers want the exotic tastes of foods that they couldn't get for many years. Um, so we're seeing uh, a lot more air experimentation around flavors, you know, which consumers might normally have found in a restaurant. When we look through an emotional needs lens, um, we also see consumers claiming, I'm always a little bit cynical about claim behaviors, um, but uh, claiming, um, wait for it, better wellness outcomes, whatever, whatever that means. Um, and the researchers believe that there is a blurring of the lines between quite a few things, and whether it be functional foods and supplements, um, but also the ongoing growth of plant proteins. And, I know that's a topic which the sector has traversed for many, many years and probably sees it as a parallel universe. Um, but what is clear is that plant proteins and advanced proteins um, are, are going to continue to evolve and uh, likely to become more important. So it's frankly unsurprising that flexitarianism is, is on the rise and um, apparently, in NZ, one third of household shoppers are claiming to reduce meat intake, um, and the key motivators are actually weight loss and cholesterol, reducing cholesterol. The lowest ranked factor was um, uh, was environmental. Uh, so this is all about health and nutrition. Across the ditch, I suppose similar figures: 43% of consumers are increasing plant food, plant food intake. Um, in the UK, apparently, 60, of the 65% of consumers who bought meat free, only just, a, only just half are looking to limit their, their intake. And when you look across facts across um, Europe, you see very, very different levels of flexitarianism. Um, at, I think Germany was one of the highest at around 30%. And, um, you know, it's probably aided by the celebrity status of people like Leonardo, um, you know, talking an awful lot about it. So, um, having said all that, maybe it's slightly amusing, because we need a little bit of humor um, in, this, um, in this session, that when we actually look, and this is very recent data, when we look at, this is really testimony, I think, to the, to the human frailty, isn't it? That we, we talk a good game, and we all, and men in particular, 50% of us are always going to go on a diet tomorrow. But the, the reality is that these are the top 10 growth segments um, across the sector in the last year. And uh, because Fazanz is in the room, I will point out that there are two whole foods in this, uh, in this group. Some of them you might be able to say have a plant food component, um, but the rest are actually just nothing more than straight out indulgence. Um, so we have, we have you know, the, uh, the desire and then we have the practical um, reality. And I've seen similar uh, detail for Australia. Um, and I suspect that, you know, wait for it, we're not alone. And so anyway, so we can, you don't need to, to agree or disagree. And you know, this is what's actually what's happening. So um, I think regardless of, you know, what people are actually doing and what they're saying, I think it is reasonably clear that there are probably sort of three areas to focus on from a trend perspective. Um, you know, one is just the, um, you know, the need to, to to address the, the haves and the have-nots. You know, we're increasingly becoming a, a bifurcated society, and I think we've probably heard some of that, um, <coughs> excuse me, dialogue, health and well-being, and then also purpose. So given the fact that we've probably seen about 10 years evolution in the last two, 
you know, I think it's really important that um, brands stay hyper, hyper alert and hyper sensitive and, and hyper, hyper quick. And it was, uh, I think, um, Business New Zealand dialogues have talked about, um, you know, having ambition and being, being quick and, um, um, and having the sort of scale. And, um, it, you know, if you're not being, if you're not disrupting, uh, you're actually being disrupted. And I think that's really very much a, 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 an outtake. Or, um, from this session. Channel mastery, I've talked an awful lot about that. Um, price pack architecture, I'm not sure that's a, um, a, a discussion that many uh, people in the meat industry have, but you know, it's really important to think about things like larger value packs, offering extra portions, or maybe just smaller packs offering lower price points. Um, third is ensuring that a wellness strategy is part of your story, so I think the meat industry does that well. If you've got iron, talk about iron. Consumers are looking to justify a purchase, and the more inherent um, benefits or features you can convert into, into uh, sorry, features you can convert into benefits, the better. And then also just grab the proverbial nettle when it comes to the sustainability narrative, and it, it is very much, um, you know, it, it's a. It's a, it's a now conversation, and especially the younger generation, um, it's far more important. So, you know, consumers are very clearly demanding products that um, have a very clear differentiator. And I'm sure there are lots of good examples, which I don't know about, sorry, in the meat industry, but, um, you know, whether that we've, we've heard this morning a lot of discussion about carbon, uh, reducing carbon emissions, but um, some brands are chasing things like helping communities, um, improving soil or reducing soil erosion um, and, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a rich dialogue, but it's you know, something that consumers are expecting. They're looking for purposefully, purposeful led brands. When we look, have a quick look, I think it's um, something that you, you know very well, that in a huge survey, 10,500 consumers in the US and Europe, 42% agree, um, agree that it's important to know that companies are taking action on carbon, on their carbon footprints, which I suspect is something we've heard before. Some of 54% of Americans say they consider a company's carbon footprint when choosing a product to purchase, which I personally found a um, little bit um, surprising. And additionally, 67% of respondents said they believe a recognizable carbon label on a product is a good idea. Uh, across the ditch in Australia, 68% of consumers are considering the environment we're making good choices. So this is something which is happening. And um, um, I was going to sort of obviously mention here Silver Fern Farms with their carbon zero promise. It's something that uh, Coles in Australia have also agreed is important with the launch of their carbon, um, is it carbon zero? Um, what is the term they use? Carbon neutral, sorry. Um, and. Um, I wasn't going to mention it, but Todd uh, Charteris mentioned this morning just the, what are the retailers doing about carbon claims. And I think it is just worth amplifying that the UK retailers, I know as we, we deal with them as well, um, they have requested suppliers to make their declarations, as you know, around carbon reduction um, goals by certain time frames. Um, and also scope one and scope two emissions now have to be declared, well, they will be very soon, because your scope one or two emissions are a retailer's scope three. Um, but if you think that's all going to happen 14,000 miles away, yes, it is, but it's going to happen here as well um, with Countdown rolling it out right now um, as we move towards having to report um, a scope three or helping them report their scope three emissions. So it really is important. Um, I mentioned packaging, which I probably haven't got time to go into in any great detail here, but this is very much the new arms race, is trying to secure recycled content. And especially in plastic and especially in New Zealand, um, it's, a very, it's a very much, it's like the hen's teeth. And um, it is something that, you know, the New Zealand recycling industry is an unbelievably nascent supply way of putting it. And, um, but certainly the, um, the challenge ahead and something the Food and Grocery Council is working hard uh, with the um, New Zealand Min uh, Ministry for Environment. Um, and the logo on, on your le uh, left or right, whichever one it is, that's the Australasian recycling logo. It's not the Australian, it's the Australasian recycling logo. That will be coming to these shores soon as well for those of you who do sell product locally. 
Um, hormones, I'll quickly touch upon hormones um, because it's something which seems to be uh, get a lot of airplay. But I was actually quite surprised when we dug into the facts that within the GS1 data of 55,000 products, um, only 280 are actually claiming to be hormone-free. So it was a surprisingly small number um, and very much the domain of the, uh, the chicken industry. And I do note that, that um, silver fern farms have, have obviously grabbed this, this proverbial nettle. Um, and then health star ratings and logos and so on. And I need to be polite because the regulator is in the room here. Um, but this apparently is driven by consumers um, but I suspect that it's probably equally balanced with the regulator. And uh, this is something which is going to be progressively um, more important. Um, and, and like Canute, it's, you know, you can't resist this one. Um, and it will continue to evolve with the development of things like advanced proteins. And the stark reality is we're getting more obese. And so the chance of this happening and progressively um, happening is, is, you know, is very clear. So I'll wrap up <coughs> excuse me, um, on just the sheer dynamic of all of these things that apparently we've got to have on, on product labels because they're being, being demanded by consumers. So you've got to be purposeful. You've got to be recycling. You've got to have all your claims. You've got to have health star logos, you've got to have, you know, whatever it is. And, but how is that actually going to work? And um, the introduction of 2D barcodes is happening right now, and I'm sure that um, for many of you who export, you're probably already dealing with 2D um, barcodes. But um, they are very much the future, and they're, I think, fantastic for fresh produce, not so much the sort of, you know, a, a can of what is baked beans, but... Um, but a code, a 2D code, can include production dates, best before dates, but um, you know, the provenance of the animal, which farm it came from, um, and also the range of other information that I've already talked about. So it's the future. And um, EU passports, uh, product passports, which were mandated in March this year, fortunately they're not on food yet, um, but I'd say just watch this space on, on that one. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, and um, you don't need to hear me prattle on anymore, but um, you know, I think that the key thing really is that you know, as we progressively move shopping online, that consumer seems to be more diligent if the Commerce Commission is to be believed that apparently they're seeing a constant step up in, in complaints about product claims. And in the EU, wait for it gets even better, EU 1169, uh, you can end up in the clink almost if you, if you get found guilty of making spurious claims on products. So the onus for your accuracy on online um, certainly seems to be stepping up. So it's a brave new world. Um, welcome for those of you who had not been to a global financial crisis before. It's <laughs> and um, thank you for your patience, and hopefully that was of some insight. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. We've got some questions coming through here, so I'll just... So, um, Mike, let's uh, get into this. So, can you tell me, what does the Council think of new players entering the retail space, e.g. Supi, um, and what opportunities does this present for suppliers getting closer to the consumer? Well, the, at the heart of the, I suppose, the the challenge that the Food and Grocery Council sees is the lack of competition. And the one thing, um, and I regret saying this, one thing that potentially even greater or more impactful than the grocery code would be having more players in the, in the segment. And um, I didn't mention it in, in my commentary, but if we look at what happens and is happening in, in countries like, um, uh, I say the UK or many countries in Europe, the the consumer flight to the hard discounters is very evident uh, as they become more challenged to, to purchase their weekly groceries. Having hard discounters in New Zealand would be fantastic. Having more retailers uh, would be fantastic. And, um, and that's very much the discussion that the Food and Grocery Council um, is keen to have. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, sorry, these are moving around on me. 
Um, the rise of label claims could be seen as overwhelming for consumers to digest. What type of technologies are on the horizon that will simplify the user experience? Yeah, the, it's probably sort of two parts to that question. I mean, one is the technology I think is probably two D par codes um, because you can ha you can have a, a, a war and peace um, a narrative attached to your label through the two D par code, which you couldn't fit all that onto the label. So, I think there's a technical solution. The um, constant clamouring for for new claims and and new forms of um, helping the consumer make informed choices, which is at the heart of what regulatory and label claims are about. I, I do believe that that's um, incredibly important, but the challenge is that consumers don't spend days at a time trying to understand what they're purchasing. And by the time a label might have one set of logos on, in 12 or 18 months time, it might be required to have another set of logos on it. And so are we actually taking consumers with us on, on the journey? And so it's very much finding a balance there. And uh, I know there's a few people in the room who I do recognize um, who I've had that conversation with. And um, it's, I think, really useful to try and find a, a solution to that. And maybe, yet again, 2D par codes are a way to do that. Thanks, Mike. Um, maybe some advice for our sector. Um, the high cost of living limits New Zealanders buying red meat and sometimes creates conflict when New Zealand products are seen cheaper overseas. What risk does this pose to trust in our sector? Any advice there? Gosh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> I'm not really a red meat industry sector specialist, so... Um, I don't know whether it really goes to, to trust. I think it's, um, if I put my consumer hat on here, uh, you know, consumers ultimately will vote with their wallet and if they can get an, a, a cheaper alternative um, as opposed to a piece of steak, it might be mince. And of course, mince goes incredibly well with what he's uh, cooking sauces. And, it does. And, um, and is the perfect offset to what is frozen vegetables, which by the way, for eight months of the year are cheaper than fresh produce and equally nutritious. So, I, th <laughs> I, th so I, I think there are, there are some very elegant solutions within our product range uh, for any consumers um, who are feeling they can't trust the red meat sector. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, another piece of advice and wisdom you may have for us, New Zealand grocery sector touches all New Zealanders. How can you help us better sell our red meat story, um, not just to our consumers, but potentially attracting future staff? I, I actually think, and I, I'm not saying this purely because I'm <laughs> literally under, under the spotlight, I actually think that the red meat industry has done a great job of promoting itself to consumers. and. And uh, you know, I think it's been pretty market leading with the way it's used um, celebrities, you know, the, 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 the um, Everwindales, is that the right name? Um, twins as an example, but also the launch of, so I think some very well put together recipe programs. Because ultimately a consumer doesn't buy products, they buy a meal. And I think the, the red meat sector has helped consumers understand how they can use meat within a meal. And, and that's the experience. And if I sort of really wind the clock back here, and this is going to be grossly out of date, but I'll say it anyway. When, when we Watties launched Food in a Minute, Alison Gofton back over two decades ago, the research that underpinned that was that 75% of consumers did not know what they were going to make for dinner that night, and that was at 4 p.m. So I'd suspect we still have a lot of consumers in that same camp. So I think just helping consumers solve that uh, eternal conundrum of what's for dinner tonight. Um, and then you know, with regard to the next generation of, of staff, uh, of people rather. And I think that the Todd Squared actually did, I thought, throw up some really useful um, ideas there. And for anybody who would like to attend a, a tenant and diversity workshop, which the Food and Grocery Council runs for a fee, and, um, uh, and 
you know, we offer uh, programs whereby the next generation of, of food um, food company executives can come and spend a day with a huge panel of chief executives from across the sector and you know, ask those questions and try and get a peek under the hood, um, trying to help them see that it's actually fast moving um, and interesting and a very, very worthwhile and career. And indeed, I'm not sure there's anything more noble than, than making or growing and producing food. It's great, Mike. I know our sector definitely needs to embrace diversity, inclusion and create experiences for the future workforce that's coming our way. Um, the question, uh, do you see the labelling of organic phasing out for the likes of regenerative or carbon zero? Ooh, um, <laughs> mm, I need to be, it's very diplomatic when I say, when I talk about regenerative, it's... Um, it, you know, it seems to be such a polarizing concept. What I will say, and you, and you know this, is that um, MPI are actually conducting a significant study in New Zealand, and um, we as a brand are a part of that, which is very exciting. And I think the, the insights around regenerative farming for crops, like the ones we produce, is that it is all about local, local, local. And it's all about the local soils, the local climate, the, and you know, the way that the crops actually perform within within a location. Um, so I'm sure there are some overriding techniques, but um, I don't know anything about regenerative farming, if it, you're talking about animals, sorry. Um, my observations are very much around um, arable farming, but um, I'm not sure I answered that question, but... No, that, no, that's all good. We've, we've got many more. We've got uh, one more, uh, time for one more question. Um, are you aware of any regulations at a grocery level for New Zealand around um, carbon labelling? You gave us some examples there of Australia. Um, mm, well, probably, I mean, you should re talk to the government departments who are in the room. Um, I'm actually not sure that MFE is here, but I'm not aware of any carbon labelling um, on the horizon at the moment. It's it's great to see quite a few brands leading with their chins and putting you know, some form of claim out. The more claims that emerge will, I suspect, lead to regulation because there'll be a desire for consistency and uniformity and transparency for consumers. So I think that that will happen. But the retailers, um, I'll finish one little anecdote. The, <clears throat> I mentioned the, the UK retailers are demanding scope emission details from the suppliers. And I don't know whether this is part of the motivation and Tesco aren't here to defend themselves, but the Tesco, as I understand it, represent 5% of the UK's total carbon emissions. And so if the government picked maybe 20 companies of that scale, they've actually wrapped up um, you know, the main emitters in the country. And if those retailers can then say to all their suppliers, you, know, you get that ripple effect or a cascade effect. So it's possible that um, that will happen here. As I said, Woolworths are already talking about it. So it's, it's something which we need to be very much ready for. And it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a now conversation. Well, thanks, Mike. Some really interesting insights there. Um, you know, we are in a very rapidly changing area with consumers' choices, perspectives, and interests continuing to evolve and will continue so for the future. So um, on behalf of Ansco Foods, just want to say thank you for your time, and, um, and I'm sure you'll be around later on for some further questions. Thank you.